So, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for trekking over from the other building and maybe foregoing your lunch early. Um, so, this session is all about the, the CNCF Storage Working Group. Um, so, the CNCF has a number of different uh, working groups which cover uh, different technology areas. Um, things like uh, security and CI/CD and serverless, etc. And this is about the, the storage working group. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, the things that we uh, that we cover in the storage working group. And if you're interested in participating, how to participate and and, and how to get involved. Because we could we really do need um, as many uh, opinions and as many uh, input as possible to to make this successful. So, my name is Alex Kirkop. Um, I'm from Storage OS, and my co speaker here is Quentin Hull, and he's from Huawei. Um, so, the Storage Working Group uh, runs twice a month. Um, we have a call at uh, 8 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. We have people joining from uh, the majority of different places in the US, as well as Europe, um, and sometimes from Asia too. Um, we have uh, we have a uh, a number of different members covering different uh, vendors in the storage space, um, but we also have a healthy number of uh, independent contributors and people who are just working on, for example, integrations uh, in the storage space as well, and, and that aren't a specific um, storage vendor. Um, and we we try to cover off. Uh, things like projects and uh, content for the CNCF uh, and other things that can help uh, storage in cloud native environments. So the reason we're doing this is because storage is, is critical to a lot of use cases when we're discussing cloud native. Um, I'm going to come out and say this, there's no such thing as a stateless architecture. At some point, every application is storing state somewhere, uh, whether that's a file system or whether that's an external service that, that it's depending on. Um, we had a we had a very good um, uh, we had a very good community event on Monday at the Cloud Native Storage Day, um, and we had uh, a number of different uh, end users and storage vendors kind of repeat this mantra because, in reality, this is this is one of the key things to to broaden the use cases of of making cloud native technologies useful. Um, so. A lot of the technologies that, that um, have been deployed in Cloud Native, such as containers, um, are all about making uh, workloads portable and making them easier to run in, in, in a platform agnostic way. Um, and to, in order for uh, containers and, and workloads to be portable, they also need the storage environments to be portable and they also need access to their data. Um, so this is all about um, making, uh, allowing, you know, uh, people to fulfill, I guess, the, the original ideals of what a containerized and an orchestrated environment would look like. Um, and generally, interoperating with storage increases the use cases, broadens the capabilities of the system, and, and leads to, to better applications. Um, the goal of storage in the CNCF is to enable a, a, striving, a, a thriving ecosystem, right? So, um, whether that whether this is um, uh, open source projects, whether it's discussion of, of services, whether it's discussion of um, uh, interactions and integrations between different systems, these are all key. So we aim to be uh, both vendor and platform neutral, um, and this is why you'll you'll sort of see cloud providers as well as storage vendors as well as individual maintainers of particular projects um, attend these meetings. Um, and this is all to, to ensure interoperability with, with a broader set of applications. So, so the mandate for the storage working group is primarily to clarify the terminology and the landscape because storage is quite a complex environment. Um, there are lots of moving parts. Um, we look at storage in two primary buckets. Um, there are uh, there's, there's, there's storage that's related to volumes, which is, which is possibly a little bit more maturely understood. Um, but there's obviously storage which is accessible through APIs, so things like um, object stores, key value stores, databases, are all, are, are all catalyst storage as, as far as the storage working group is concerned. 
Um, so we're looking to, uh, to understand these terminologies, we're looking to understand how the automation works, how things are integrated under various landscapes, um, and understand how the different implementations of these solutions actually affect how the storage is consumed in your applications. So we, one of the we, we've been working on a uh, we've been working on a white paper and we've been trying to capture a lot of this information to cover the different attributes and the different um, and the different types of systems and the different types of, of capabilities out there. The other thing we do is we've over the over the last year we've we've had. Um, uh, presentations from a lot of uh, very interesting projects in the in the storage world. So things like um, CSI, for example, which is uh, which which has now just um, gone to uh, GA with, with, with version 1.0 and the latest version of Kubernetes, um, and this covers the integration parts between um, uh, storage provisioners and, and Kubernetes to move uh, storage provisioning out of the core Kubernetes code and make it an external process instead. Um, things like uh, Rook, uh, which, which got accepted as a sandbox project earlier on in the year and got um, voted to, uh, to be promoted as an incubation project for, for the CNCF uh, uh, a couple of months now back. Um, and Rook provides um, a framework and a set of tools to automate and to help abstract different storage systems, starting with Ceph, but adding support for other things like, like Minio and, and a number of other projects. Um, projects like, uh, like Vitesse, which, talks, which, which is a, a, a very large scale sharded uh, SQL implementation. Uh, which, uh, which uh, again, there's um, a number of stands in the in the sponsor boots which can which can talk about that, and other projects like um, I never know how to pronounce this TIKV, which is which is a, a I think titanium key value store, which is um, which is a, a distributed key value store and provides um, extreme scalability and is and is an alternative to uh, to uh, an alternative uh, key value store which can be integrated into into databases and apart from that things like um, open EBS and open SDS um, which which are which are which are very interesting projects and help shape the contents that we're that we're providing as well as providing inputs to um, the broader CNCF community so with that I'm going to hand over to Quinton who um, who heads up who chairs the storage working group um, and is uh, was driving the um, one of the, our main projects this year, which is uh, a storage landscape, um, and he'll tell you a little bit more about that and the project that we've been working on together. So the storage SIG, as it stands today, is is, is a Kubernetes um, uh, is a Kubernetes uh, uh, SIG, and they and they work on Kubernetes specific projects. The CNCF uh, Storage Working Group is, um, is is a is a CNCF initiative, and it's and it's and it's broader than just Kubernetes. It covers technologies which which are um, generically cloud native and maybe storage systems that that aren't specifically related to Kubernetes. Yeah, I think there's one more. I think I think maybe that will be answered in the next section of the slides, and, and yeah. we can pick it up at the end if, yeah. if you like. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Quinton. Um, thanks very much for the intro, Alex. Um, in addition to working for Huawei, I've been on the Kubernetes project since pretty much day one. Um, and I also ran a lot of the big systems at Google before that and started EC2 at Amazon way back in the mid-2000s, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm currently on the Technical Oversight Committee of the CNCF. And one of the things we identified fairly early on was that you know storage is a vast landscape. Um, and there are many complicated and and competing ways of solving these problems related to storing things, particularly in cloud native. 
And uh, we really wanted to uh, just get everyone together, agree on a common set of terminology, agree on a common set of understandings of how these things plug together in, in a way that we could communicate to the public so that it looked less like uh, a spaghetti mesh of competing storage vendors and more like some coherent uh, ecosystem that we could then start having meaningful and, and sensible discussions about. Um, so that was, you know, how I got involved in the storage working group. Uh, I'm not actually a storage expert. Uh, I have to, you know, put that out there. Um, I did, uh, I was involved in the design of EBS at Amazon, and I've obviously run and built a bunch of storage systems since then, um, but I, I would not categorize myself. I'm just going to interject slightly. So a wise person once told me, if somebody says they're not an expert, they probably are. <laughs> That person's not, not wise enough <laughs> in this case. OK, so anyway, uh, I'll stop rambling now. Uh, basically, this is just a prelude to uh, the next part of the talk, which is, so we, we set about writing a white paper. Uh, and what we wanted to do was essentially present people with something digestible um, that they could use um, to understand. So given a product, you know, where does, what is this product? And can we you know, at least slot it into a diagram? And how do I figure out? the pros and cons of this product versus some other product. Is, is it in the same space? And if so, how does it differ? And what are the metrics that we can use to understand where those differences might lie? So, um, so yeah, definition of attributes of a storage system. So what does it mean to be highly available? What does it mean to be highly scalable? What does it mean to be um, highly durable? Um, it, you know, sometimes these words are assumed to have particular meanings. Uh, but often when you dive under the hood, there's, there's way more detail there than one might think. And in some cases, a lot of misunderstanding about even basic terms. And the one I often pull out is consistency. And I'll, I'll use my little um, audience interaction trick that I used on Monday. Apologies to those of you who were at Storage Day. Um, so how many of you have heard of the CAP theorem? Does anyone know what the CAP theorem is? OK, excellent. So everybody knows about the CAP theorem, give or take. And what does the C in CAP stand for? Consistency, excellent. So everyone's nodding and saying consistency. And how many of you have heard of ACID databases? Lots of hands, everyone knows about ACID databases. And what does the C in ACID stand for? Consistency, right. And are those the same consistency in CAP and ACID? So there are some shaking heads. I, I guess it was a leading question. They're completely different kinds of consistency. <laughs> and so people who kind of think they know what consistency means, and, and this is not a criticism. I was in this camp not very long ago. Someone pointed out to me that, in fact, there's, there's like a whole menagerie of consistency. And if you think that you get to choose between consistent or available or partition tolerant, uh, it's, it's way more complicated than that. So uh, just to, you know, to illustrate why it's useful to have common terminology. <clears throat> the other thing that is somewhat not always understood, and, and I think we can perhaps blame some of the overzealous uh, marketing and sales people uh, around exactly what various different projects and products do. Um, so, you know, there's this concept of a storage system and you buy one and it stores your stuff for you. Turns out that there's a whole variety of pieces that you have to fit together before you actually have a useful thing. Um, and, and not all of the projects provide all of those pieces. So it's, it's important to, to just be un, able to understand how they all fit together. Um, data access interfaces, you know, sometimes people talk about a block store or a file system or a object, an object store or a key value store. Um, to some extent, those define an, an API or an a, a, data access interface, but they don't actually define the properties of the system. So, so there are numerous examples where you know, S3 is an object store, and it has a particular interface. Um, and implicit in S3's uh, product uh, offering is that it's very highly durable and that your data gets replicated across multiple geographies, um, and that it will never go away. And uh, Implicit, perhaps less well spoken about, is that the latency is fairly high. It's designed specifically for you know, fairly large objects, things like videos and backups and photographs and things. Um, and, and so it has, a, and it has a cost model associated with it. But, but actually, Object Store doesn't 
necessarily mean all of those things. And there are numerous projects that have implemented things that have exactly the same API as S3, and they say, I'm an object store, but they don't actually keep three copies of your objects in different geographies, and they don't have the same latency uh, properties and durability properties and cost properties and many other things. So, so it's, it's worth just making that distinction. Um, and then we can, yeah, we're going to talk more about some of the other areas too. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the detail. We have a deep dive session. Is it at 4.30 today, Alex? I think so. Okay, 3.45. Um, uh, where we will go into much more detail about the, the contents of this paper, but it's, it, we just thought we would tell you about the fact that it is one of the things we've been working on. Uh, we had a bunch of authors, um, some of them experts in particular, categories, uh, which was very useful. Uh, Shing's been very involved in open SDS and CSI and other areas. Um, you may or may not recognize Xiang Li, who actually was one of the uh, initial implementers of etcd. He was on stage the other day. So we figured if we want to have someone tell us about key value stores, we probably uh, do worse than him. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and several other people with lots and lots of experience uh, in, in various areas. So hopefully we got reasonable coverage. Um, so where do we go from here? So th this white paper uh, is, is largely done. Uh, it's been out and available for comment for uh, a couple of months now, since before Shanghai, just over a month. Um, so I think we're going to sort of declare that done. <clears throat> Working groups uh, in the CNCF world have a finite lifespan, and they set out to do a particular thing, and this particular thing has mostly been accomplished. So the question is, do we reformulate, you know, essentially set another set of things that this working group should do next, or do we dissolve and say the job is done? Uh, we've had a few suggestions as to what the next goals should be. Um, one of them would be to get a deep understanding of, of a set of particular use cases. So it would be great to dive into understanding, you know, where Netflix stores all its videos and how they all work, and, and where, uh, you know, how, how various, you know, high profile big storage solution, uh, big storage implementations have actually been done, pros and cons, problems they faced, you know, things that were successful. So I think that would be useful. Um, the CNCF has also um, <clears throat> identified that the, the Technical Oversight Committee on which I serve, it's only nine people, most of them are, are you know, very uh, experienced and, and fairly senior people in, in big companies. Uh, not, well, not all big companies, but they're certainly busy people. And they don't necessarily have the bandwidth to uh, spend as much time as is required with all of the projects as they expand. We cu currently have uh, more than 30 CNCF projects, I think, altogether. And that's growing you know, rapidly. It's not unimaginable that we might have 100 in a year's time. Uh, and nine people spread across 100 projects is just too thin. Um, so uh, that's the one area. The other area is that you know, there are specific, I mean, the, the, this landscape is pretty broad, and this goes beyond storage, but um, there are many, many very specialized areas, and, and nine people cannot be experts and highly specialized experts on, on all of those areas. So what we're looking to do is form um, special interest groups. So many of you will be familiar with the Kubernetes special interest groups, which will uh, enable us to kind of federate the, the, the responsibility for deep dive technical stuff into new projects and existing projects, and also just generally, you know, monitoring the health and, and happiness of, of the ever-growing set of projects in the CNCF. And so one area is obviously storage. So uh, we're looking at transforming what is currently a working group into a special interest group, and that would be responsible for all of the projects, uh, storage-related projects in the CNCF, as well as um, evaluating and advising the TOC on future storage-related projects. Um, so that might be something people might want to get involved in. Um, so that's the last item on the slide there. Uh, other things that you might want to do if you're interested in storage, uh, one is ask questions at the end of this talk, and we can hopefully have a lively discussion uh, if anyone has anything they want to talk about. And there are also a bunch of uh, other presentations still coming up that you might be interested in. Alex and I are doing another one of these in much more detail uh, later today. Uh, and then uh, I went to read through all of them, but there are several interesting talks you might want to attend. You can look them up in the schedule. And with no further ado, 
let's open up the floor to questions, discussions. We have a good few minutes left, I guess 10. So fire away. I'm not sure this is the right uh, forum, but in a container native storage world, does it still make sense to think about uh, backups and restores? Or more in general, does the storage lifecycle changes completely or do we still have the same processes? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and I think there are, I definitely think there are cases for backups and restores. Uh, I've seen enough of them, even in, in cloud native storage where um, depending on your level of paranoia or your uh, cost structure, um, they make sense. So, so I can give you a good example. Um, I don't think any of this is proprietary knowledge, so hopefully it's okay. But you can imagine behind it something like EBS. Um, you, you write to a block store. Um, there are multiple copies of that block store, uh, that block written across um, different physical machines. If any physical machine or drive dies, you still have copies. They get re-replicated, everything. Um, however, uh, all of those are in a single data center. So if that data center burns to the ground, your data is gone. Um, and secondly, uh, two, you know, multiple drives failing at the same time is not unheard of, you know, especially if there was the same manufacturer drive installed at the same time. Guess what? Uh, if you have a mean time to failure of two years, there's a, there's a big bump at about two years. And if, if you fail one drive and before you've managed to copy all the contents to another drive, that one it fails, um, you also are not in a good place. And besides that, software rollouts fail. So I was at Amazon when we uh, managed to corrupt a large number of disks uh, through a software error. Um, and so the answer was, go back to your backups, please. We gave you a very good snapshot facility for snapshotting to S3 back in the day. And this is 10 years ago, so please excuse me if any of this data is out of date. But, but there's a good example. Um, etcd is another example where you have multiple etcd uh, replicas. Um, each one of them has a disk behind it. Uh, and in theory, they're all replicated and redundant, and you can't lose your etcd store. Uh, but you do. You know, People upgrade etcd, and the store gets corrupted, and you have to restore from backups. So I think there are use cases for both. Yeah, and, and, and just to, to sort of add to that, it's a lot of the storage systems provide capabilities to protect your data, whether it's you know through um, parities or copies of the data or snapshots or replicas, etc. But that doesn't protect you from human error when somebody deletes something by mistake or from a software bug when it goes and corrupts half your records in your system or indeed, say, a database corruption or something like that. So there are always going to be things where, where a backup is still, is still critical. But good question. And, and a common uh, misperception, which is, you know, we replicate your data, so therefore you don't need to back it up. Yeah, I, was, I was hoping to see a backup and restore abstraction in Kubernetes sometimes in the future. Uh, we happen to have Xing in the back row there. Xing, do you want to talk to us about backup and restore in Kubernetes? <clears throat> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Could somebody pass her the microphone, please? We need to record, or, or I can, yeah, no. better to give you a mic. Uh, right, so for in uh, Kubernetes right now, we actually, we are, uh, we just added a snapshot support in Kubernetes and CSI. So with that, you can, based on that, and uh, build your backup and restore solutions. So right now, we have just added the basic building block, volume snapshot support. Right, so next step is uh, we are going to add the execution hook. Uh, so to make sure that uh, the uh, snapshot is uh, consistent. So that's uh, something then uh, other applications can build on top of that. So one thing we have not uh, made decision is whether uh, we should uh, uh, do this work within six storage or we should do part of this work um, like at like the ecosystem build those applications. Like the, uh, something we are discussing is group snapshot that allow you to actually create a snapshot of a group of volumes that, that belongs to a application. Uh, so we did discuss about that, but then we have not decided yet whether the scope of that work uh, is belongs to six storage or maybe it's workload or some other ecosystem. But uh, if you're interested, we actually have uh, weekly meetings on volume snapshot, so you are welcome to join us. So, I don't know Thanks if Scott has any. <laughs> Thanks. 
Hi, thanks. Um, the first question is, I was coming in a little late. Do you have a link to the white paper for that? Um, That's a good question. The answer is in my slide deck. I forgot to put one. Um, <laughs> but uh, we should, uh, we, we, we need to distribute it. We'll send it out to Kubernetes Dev, uh, Kubernetes Sig Storage. Uh, there's a working group mailing list for this working group. We'll send it out there. Um, yeah. OK. Um, and on that, with that white paper and with uh, the focus of the work group and the SIG, is the is like the primary goals of of taking the different storage solutions that are going to be available and just trying to categorize them in the different types, like you were saying, where you have your key value store, you have your object store, and stuff like that, and then kind of building a um, an acceptance criteria within that group. Is that what the goal is? Um, I don't think we're really in the business of developing acceptance criteria. Um, I think what we really are in the business of is explaining things to people and making it possible to actually have reasonable discussions. So um, I think saying that you can't call yourself a key value store if you don't provide consensus is maybe not a useful thing to do. What, what we would prefer to do is say that there are key value stores, some of them provide consensus, some of them provide local access, some of them provide remote access, so and we'll, give them names so that we can say that etcd is a consensus-based key value store, and um, you know something else is, is a different kind of key value store, so don't confuse the two. So it's more like the goal of the SIG is to try to kind of categorize all the different types of storage and give a, a kind of a brief explanation of what the use case would be for that type of storage. Exactly, and, and usually it's pros and cons. You know, these consensus is very useful if you need uh, high availability and you don't want to lose your data, but it's high latency and it has bottlenecks through the master, so don't be surprised when you run into those things when you use those kind of key value stores and use them for things that they're designed to be used for, not for something else. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I, the last answer uh, brought some kind of dissonance to me, and I want to emphasize uh, my question. Sure. Are you dealing with control plane only, or you are dealing with, let's say, data planes, the storage backends, the storage transport protocols as well? What are you covering? That's a very good question. Uh, Alex, did you want to answer it? or? Did sure. You? Um, so, so the white paper actually covers covers both topics. Um, it's it's both the um, both the data plane side of things. So, say the data access interface and the various levels of um, that of various layers in a storage system, like things like the data protection and the topologies of the different storage systems and that sort of thing, as well as the orchestration and the management interfaces. So things like um, CSI, the different uh, interfaces, whether it's native drivers or say the, the, the Docker driver and, and, and other similar um, technologies, as well as um, other frameworks, for example, which are, which are cropping up like the Rook project, um, which, which helps, for example, the automation of deployment of different storage systems, for example. That's also a follow-up for the questions before. So the topics like encryption, the duplication, and compression, are they covered there as well, or it's beyond the scope? Um, we we do cover we do cover uh, we do cover data services. So things like um, uh, snapshots, clones, um, erasure, code. uh, erasure coding, replicas, that kind of thing. We don't really have a section on encryption, but that's a good point. We could add yeah. something to that. Yeah, it was a bit of a balancing act. Um, you know, if you write a 150-page document, nobody will read it. Uh, and if you write a one-page document that doesn't have anything in it, people ignore it. Um, so we tried to strike the balance there. Uh, I think we ended up, in fact, we should read 40 pages long, and we were brief, so. <laughs> it, it is, but there, there's actually quite a lot of, it, it's, it's not really 40 pages, it's more like 25, because there's a lot of white space okay. and stuff. But, <laughs> but uh, I think we tried to uh, at least you know, structure the landscape so that you could understand where these different things fit in and that they exist. 
uh, and provide links to further detail. Uh, you know, we certainly don't go into every single erasure coding algorithm and all of the detail there, but we do mention that it exists, this is why it exists, and this is why you may or may not want to dig deeper if you want to, and here's more information. Does that answer your question, or is that useful? Cool. Any other questions? Right, well, thank you very, yeah. How I became a member of this school? That's a very good question. Um, so we have uh, bi-weekly meetings. I think we had the detail here. Um, so twice a month on a Wednesday, we have a meeting. There is a mailing list which you can subscribe to, and send messages to if you want to communicate with other people similarly interested in storage. Uh, and you can also go back through the archived minutes and uh, videos of these meetings. Right. Yeah, one more. <laughs> we actually have some more time, so don't be shy if there are more questions. The, the intention of the session was actually to more have a discussion than, than actually teach you stuff. Uh, well, I was hoping you could talk to what makes storage cloud native versus uh, maybe not cloud native storage. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the elephant in the room. <laughs> Do you want to take that one, Alex? OK, I'll try. Um, so I'm, I'm going to come out straight and say we're, we're not here to rule in or rule out stuff, which is cloud native or not cloud native. Um, at the end of the day, there's a huge array of different technologies, whether it's volume-based services or API-based services covering everything from you know, block file, uh, shared file, distributed systems, key value stores, and there are several flavors of key value stores and several flavors of object stores and several flavors of databases. Um, and the reality is all of them have a place and all of them have a, all, all of them have a use case. And, ha and, and what we're trying to do is, is define the properties of those different systems so that rather than trying to shape your application around a fixed storage solution, you can actually pick a storage solution that is appropriate for your application use cases. Um, and uh, discuss how you can interface with those solutions in orchestrated environments like, like with Kubernetes or, 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 say, containerized workloads, for example. Yeah, I just had one, one more comment to add there. It was quite interesting. So having been involved right from the beginning of, of cloud computing, basically, uh, there's been this kind of cycle which is interesting to follow. So in the early days when we... Uh, provided people with virtual machines, and we said you can pay by the hour, and they're not very reliable, you know, the machines crash, it's commodity hardware. Um, people wanted to have access to local disks, um, because that's what they used to, they used to have local disks, or they wanted a file server in the corner. And, uh, and so we spent a lot of effort trying to educate people to understand that, in fact, your local disks have a lot of problems associated with them. One, they go away. Two, you have contention because you have more than one virtual machine on a, on a per disk or per, per machine. Um, and so they are useful for some things, but they're not the same local disks that you used to have on your server in the corner. And similarly, if you have um, you know, uh, 100 million uh, virtual machines in a, in a public cloud service, uh, you cannot have them all hit your NetApp server at the back of the room because things ain't going to work so good. So therefore, you end up with other solutions that perhaps address some of those issues. Um, so, so we had to take people from where they were at the time to just educate them about some of the limitations of the traditional ways they did things and encourage them to look at alternatives. I think the pendulum has almost swung the other way now, and now you've got all these you know, cloud-native stores which, which have a bunch of limitations and, and downsides of their own, but everyone's like, we have to use these things on the far end of the cloud-native spectrum because all the other stuff is rubbish. So uh, maybe we, we sort of did our job too well in the early days, and we need to come back to, uh, I think, some semblance of, of sensibility in the middle of that, which is we have now many more options than we had 15 years ago, they all have use cases where they are appropriate and use cases where they're not, and have people able to make those decisions themselves. Yeah. Is there any connection between this working group and SNIA? 
Sorry, I didn't hear the last bit. And, and, and the SNIA, the Storage Network Unity Association. Because I think, the, m m what I'm trying to understand is there is the team that is dealing with the actual development of the standard, like the, the storage SIG and the CSI team. And then there is also some kind of an industry-wide uh, group that works on the overall storage directions and, and ideas within SNIA. And, and, and this group is kind of somewhere in, the bet in between. I'm trying to understand what, what's the goal. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so this group is, is fairly and squarely CNCF focused. So we only really care about the CNCF. We don't care about standardizing the industry or telling anybody how to do anything. Uh, we're just uh, people in the CNCF. So, so CNCF is, essentially has you know, two groups of, of members. We have members who um, are build projects. Uh, and those projects want to know some of this information and want to be able to work together. Uh, and then we have consumers, and consumers basically want to know how to use cloud-native uh, software provided by the CNCF. And so those are our two customers. Um, <clears throat> and you know, there's obviously interactions. Our customers want to know how to plug their you know, vendor XYZ storage into their application. We have to help them do that as well. Um, but our, our focus is CNCF, not the industry as a whole, or hardware vendors, or anything else. However, that said, there are crossovers. So for example, we had presentations from you know, the Swordfish and the Redfish um, projects, which, which, which were you know, really useful as well. Great. I think with that, we're pretty much out of time. Thank you all. And, uh, <laughs>